How are things in California? Oh no, it's not. Well, I'm 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 north of California in Seattle. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very good. Very yeah. good. We're just in the um, same. We're in the same uh, time zone. Yes. Yes. Of yeah. course. Oh, I'd love to go to Seattle someday. Looks like great it's city. nice. I think you'd like it. Uh, it's yeah. it's got a lot of the same climate and temperament as uh, your neck of the woods. I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of rain. Like yeah, it, in other it, words. you know, it's we we hear that a lot. And actually, last year we did get a lot of rain. It's not that it rains all the time; it threatens to rain all the time. Uh, it's we have like uh, there's this place just south of here. I think it's 220 overcast days a year. <laughs> so it's great, wow. great for the skin, but good luck getting a tan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, brilliant. Well, listen. Um, Thanks for joining us on this. This is obviously a pre-record. Oh, yeah. Um, I, this is a report that will be going out early next week. Okay. Just about trying to understand some of the theories um, behind the flat earth community. Sure. Um, so I just have a few questions that I want to focus on. Yeah. Um, just to get it clear, because I've been really enjoying watching your videos. They're so, so clearly laid out and so well written. Well, um, thanks. So that's been really helpful, uh, yeah. but I just want to get a little bit of clarity on a couple of things. Yeah. Um, first of all, why is NASA enemy number one for flat earthers? What What is the the conspiracy there? Um, NASA is the biggest target. I mean, they have the biggest, obviously, big bullseye on their back because they're the most public. They are the default front men of science. You know, when you look in over here, I don't know what you have over there in terms of like, you know, over here, our news is divided into categories, you know, politics and business and sports and entertainment. And there's a, there's always a science section over here. And in that science section, a collection of science stories of any, on any given day or any given week, NASA probably takes up at least a third to a half of them. Always, all the time, whatever's NASA is doing, the cutting edge of science has to be NASA. And so, and because we think everything that NASA has done since they were created in 1958 is fake, is a lie, then again, they're, they're, that's, that's why we focus on them. And they're, and they're pretty easy to tear down because they have a lot of footage for different things. Some, some things they have no footage on at all, you know, like the, the blue marble from space. They only took two shots in 43 years. But then they they release all okay, this. Okay, so just let's be really let's be really uh, specific then. So when you yeah. say that everything that NASA has done is fake, yeah, what what is their intention? What are they are they trying to make the world believe something? Or well, what what do you believe about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so when I say that everything, okay, why why would NASA fake this? Uh, and remember, NASA is just the front men for the powers that be, for for lack of a better term, the the people that don't care about bank accounts and, and the people that want to rework civilization as we know it. Um, but as far as why NASA would fake it, and, and by that, I, I'm going to be going to different places. But what I also have to clarify is that 99% of the people in NASA are just doing their jobs. They don't sure. know. They don't know anything. They're just compartmentalized. I mean, people that build fuel systems and people that mop the floors and people that do HR and all that you n almost nobody knows anything about anything compartmentalization is brilliant there because they are a military operation but why you would fake it in fact the easiest answer is is probably to compare it to the uh my argument for the moon missions way back before flat earth uh people people over here i don't again i still am amazed why outside of america people believe in the american space program and, and the answer is always the same well because it was on television it was on the news. It has to be real. Um, but over here, we've been criticizing it literally since they've stopped doing it. In uh, you know, the, the last moon mission here was in 1972, which is a long time ago. And we started tearing it apart back then. And I always thought that it's like, okay. And, and everyone tried to come up with reasons for why. It's like, why fake the space program? Why fake the space program? And for the longest time, for decades, it was, well, because... <clears throat> It, um, it's it's a patriotic thing. You know, it's America's got to be the greatest. We've got to put this image out there. Rah, rah, wave the flag, go team, red, white, and blue. And I thought, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good answer, but it's not a great answer. I mean, it's okay. It'll pass. 
but it's not great. And then when I got into flat earth, then I understood. That's when it's like, okay, it's not that you that you wanted to fake the moon missions. You had to fake the moon missions. You had to fake space. Because if you don't, eventually the private companies will get involved and, and you can't have that. You've got to control space. You've got to militarize space for as but why long... Why isn't it possible for you to why isn't it possible for the earth to be flat and also for there to be space can the two not coexist well, the two they, ideas they can but why do it meaning um if 90 it's a, that's a great question why why do you have to have both meaning if 99 percent of the people believe in the illusion that's what you go with and and i'm not trying to look i, I grew up in an evangelical christian home it's not that I'm saying that, that because we didn't, also let me clarify that we had no part in building this place at all. We had, you know, people keep saying, oh, do, do we build it? No. And, and I'm saying really either it's the creator that built it or an older civilization that's much more powerful than ourselves. And because people say, are you calling God lazy? Are you saying that God didn't, didn't make space? I go, well, no, God's very, very efficient. So why would he have to make space? The planetarium example which is great, which is you go into a planetarium, you look up and you say, oh, there's Jupiter, the moons of Jupiter. Can you land on it? No, you can't. Does it look spherical? Yes, it does. Can you take pictures of it? Yes, you, yes, you can. Um, you don't have to have space. Why, what, if, 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 the, if the person that's living in this world will never make it to another body, planetary body, even with our best technology, the moon excluded, because that's just a lie, then you don't have to, there doesn't have to be space. Why, why do it? It's just pretty lights in the sky and fine, you can zoom in on them. Great resolution, but uh, it just doesn't have to be there. So the stars then, they are kind of luminaries. Yeah. They're not yeah, are yeah, they yeah. created by NASA, the stars? No, 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 no. The stars, everything in the sky, I love the sky system. Um, in fact, in the, in the software world where I came from, uh, it's literally called the sky box system which is everything in the sky that you see, everything from planets to stars to deep space objects, wh whatever you, know, you can zoom in on, is just really an elaborate, ornate clock system which predates language. That's, that's all it is. It's a clock that, that, you know, that it's not just minutes and hours. It, you, know, you, can, you can do your crops based on the stars, and they did back in the day and, and it didn't matter where you were from everyone kind of, if you stared at the sky long enough and back then that's really the only thing you had to stare at you could figure it out and once you figured out kind of how the clock system worked you could start planning your uh, your days and years based okay. on it so now one of the things i'm interested in and i wonder can you explain this for our audience mark mm -hmm. is yeah um, the way commercial flights happen in the Southern Hemisphere. Can right. you tell me a bit about that? Because that is very revealing, isn't it? Yeah, you know, that was one of those things. And that was given to me by a guy. Um, uh, that hint was given to a guy over in your neck of the woods uh, back in 2015, where he was going, look at the long haul flights. He goes, they don't make any sense. And for, for your listeners that don't know what a long haul flight is, it's... <clears throat> Any flight that's really over, I don't know, 12, 13 hours, long flights. And what we were noticing was, the first thing I noticed was in the Southern Hemisphere, any flights that happen between those continents down there, you know, like if you're flying from South America to Africa or Australia or New Zealand or say anything below the equator, if we're talking about a globe, then, you know, you should expect flights to go a certain way, a certain route, normally over the South Pacific Ocean or the Indian Ocean or the Southern Atlantic Ocean. And what was interesting was, you know, because they're still out there. You can look up Flight Tracker. There's some wonderful live, and I, I know there's a delay for security reasons, but it, but it works for the most part. And I was watching these planes leave wherever in the Southern Hemisphere going to you know from southern hemisphere to southern hemisphere so you can't you know don't say you know from um from south america to north america that's 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 different we we want to track what's happening down below the equator and <clears throat> when they got about 150 miles offshore maybe 200 miles as long as there was no other island with a ground radar station near them those planes would blink out and even if the graphic was there, what was happened was the latitude and longitude coordinates would disappear and go into approximated or estimated mode. 
And I thought it was fascinating. And in fact, in some of the software, I don't know if it's changed. And I mean, some people have said, well, the graphic's still there now. It's like, whatever. But back then I was looking at it and the plane would disappear. Just gone. But why did they? Why did the flights have to go up to the northern hemisphere before they get to another location in the south? <laughs> yeah, that's the big question, isn't it? It's because we, in a lot. Again, we're covering a lot of ground. But when you, if you just pretend to book a flight from like anywhere in South America to anywhere in Africa or Australia or something like, ninety percent, ninety-five percent of the flights in the southern hemisphere are not direct. They connect through the northern hemisphere. And it's just bizarre to watch because you're, you're looking, if you're looking on a globe, these, these flights take these weird high arcs, dub, and like sometimes doubling the distance and more. Uh, I mean, I saw connecting double and triple connection flights that would take upwards of 40 something hours to, to, to make their Why ride. are they doing that? Well, because <clears throat> it's, it's not, because it's not a globe. Uh, on a flat model, that's why, uh, that's the only way it works. And I, I initially, uh, I, I didn't discover it. I was just really confirming it, which was if you take the flights, the Southern Hemisphere flights, and you overlay them onto a flat model, which is known as the AE map, which is known as the azimuthal equidistant map. I know it's a little bit of a mouthful, but you can look it up, which is basically the UN flag, by the way. The, uh, when you look at it, the, those high, high arc angles turn into shallow dog legs and sometimes straight lines. And it's the shortest distance between two points. Now, is it is it a perfect model? No. Are there questions about some of the flights? Yes, absolutely. Uh, but it's it's fascinating. Again, if you look at connecting flights, they and I know it's tough to do on radio to describe it, but you can look it up yourself, and we have some wonderful videos on it, where the flights just turn into these. It makes sense. Um, or or the emergency flights. Those are even better if you've ever heard of those. Uh, there are no flights. There, there's no flights from. Um, or, or sorry, sorry, there's very few. Very flights. few. Well, and, and again, that's uh, and, and I mean, there is there is one flight, but there is one flight from um, Santiago in Chile to yep. Sydney yep. in Australia that's yep. operated by Qantas. Yep, Qantas. So why why would they do that? Well, that's a long distance. <clears throat> why wouldn't they? If the Earth is flat, why wouldn't they just go? up across the, the North Pole? Yeah, it's a great question. In fact, it was it was interesting that, because when I was doing it, and I, there's only so much research I could do back in 2015, but sure. I, when I when I did the initial clue, clue seven, and I said, look, I can't find any freaking direct flights. And then people said, well, there's this, like, just a handful. And it really bothered me that nobody was looking at the fact that 90 something percent of the flights in the southern hemisphere were double and triple connections they were focusing on these like what i think there were maybe five tops and yeah, it's mind-blowing it, it was really mind -blowing. when you look at it <laughs> yeah and in fact there was um uh, a travel one of my subject matter experts was a uh, a travel uh, advisor down in the southern hemisphere and she contacted me and she goes you have no idea how difficult it is to fly people down here she goes in the northern hemisphere it's just a question of time it's like oh yeah what, you know when can we get on our flight you can get you can get direct okay. flights all the time she goes there are capital cities in the southern hemisphere which you cannot get direct flights to no matter how much money you have you can't crazy yeah it just blows blows my um, mind so now I, I i i wish i could speak for for for, for longer but uh, i'm under time pressure so okay, i want to okay. get to a couple of other questions okay that's fine. Has there ever been a mission to find the edge of the world? Is that even possible? Well, not for lack of trying. Uh, the desire is there. We, we'd love to do it. In fact, there have been television producers that have been talking to us the last five years. That have said, oh, yeah, we got to do a thing in Antarctica. I go, great. Look at the Antarctic Treaty and tell me how you pull that thing off. Because the that was that was one of the big kickers for me. In fact, that was my push over the, the line Thing because the Antarctic Treaty, which was ratified in 1959, right after NASA was founded and right after the Van Allen radiation belts were announced, uh, and the Antarctic Treaty says that no corporation, this includes you know expedition stuff, but no corporation can set up shop down in Antarctica ever. No one can own any part of Antarctica. I mean, yes, it's divided up into a whole bunch of different things, but it's it's locked down for all time. It's not even up for review until 2041. And that so what was, you're saying is because it's 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 locked down, that means that it's it's almost impossible 
for anyone to try and get near the edge. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The the 60th parallel down there is the limit. They even expanded it at one point. In fact, right after we started making videos, they expanded it to where you can't even... The, even drones now are forbidden on the Antarctic ice. I thought that was just hilarious. It's like, really? You're going to ban drones to, you know, a year and a half after, after we get in there? Amend the treaty? But yeah... Um, what about the mission by the British Antarctic survey in 1958 or the late 1950s that um, was the well, first time that the, apparently a transcontinental trip was undertaken in antarctica and the team went from one side to the other yeah not if you look at the the map closely when you look at it they didn't really cross it they all they did and everyone mentions these from time to time which is they 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 say they crossed this little sliver and they say oh yeah we we we, we crossed it uh no i'm sorry it... but that that was well documented by national geographic <laughs> or do you think national geographic are they are they in on the conspiracy national geographic who interviewed me uh at some point a couple of years ago they hate us they uh they they do not like that well again remember national geographic is is founded on the uh, the backbone of science. They they are the, the the periodical of science. That's them. And they when we did oh, a, a real, I know you're limited on time, but really really quick, we did a salt and sea experiment with them um, in California, where we were shooting across just nine miles, a visual test, nine miles across this this salt lake type thing, and yeah. we saw their their test balloons when it shouldn't have been possible. And they were so upset by this, they removed the segment entirely from the. But who are they? Work? Why would they be part of the conspiracy? Why are well, they not? No, well, again, not independent. It's it's not it's not that they are. They're not getting their marching orders from the the, sure. pow the powers that be directly. However, it is in their best interest to keep the integrity of science at all times. They will always paint. I mean, like when they were trying to get me to to yell and, and say bad things about our astronauts, the American astronauts. And I think they cut that part out of the of the interview. They, oh, that's they, not fair. Yeah. yeah, they they want to to keep you know they want science to be completely rock solid all the time. Science, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson's lines, you know, science is true whether or not you believe in it. One of the most arrogant things I've ever heard, and that's that's what they do. Again, it's it's not that they're you know wearing a black hat and twirling a mustache and and being all evil. It's that look, they're protecting their own interests, and they National Geographic's been around since the eighteen hundreds. So they're they're not going anywhere. They they are not going to back down. Their their audience would be. Are there any scientists, any uh, professional, well regarded scientists who are part of the community of flat earthers? No, no. You and, and that's a great question. No, you can't. You you can't be a scientist and be part of the flat earth community. Mostly. Why? Why not? Well. And I, I know a number of academics, and they've all told me the same thing. It's like once you reach a master's level or higher, and especially if you get into PhD, all you care about is your community, your your academic community, and being published. The the scariest word in the world for an academic is ostracized, which means if you make the the community look bad in any capacity, it's it's very cliquish, very high school. They will push you out of that group and say, yeah, you don't get to talk to us anymore. And that, that is a death sentence for an academic. So it's Im virtually impossible for a scientist to become, a, to believe in, or, or not to believe, but Ad to... Admit it? Yeah, no, they can't. They, they can't. If they did... But they might believe in the flat earth, but sure. they can't admit it. Oh, no, no. I, oh, hell. There was, a, uh, there was a great Asian... When I was being roped in for an interview down in Los Angeles, and they were looking for a physicist to go against me, and I remember they called up, they told me this off air, they, they called up um, USC, University of Southern California, and there was an, uh, an Asian professor, and, and, he, and, he, and he goes, oh, wow, you know, Flat Earth? He goes, yeah, I'd love to talk about that. It's like, okay, you're going to be going against Mark Sargent. It's like, going ag against Flat Earth? No, 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 I'm all for it. And it's like, did you get this guy's name? And of course, even if I did pin him down, it'd be very, very tough to do. I mean, hell, uh, real quick, there was a structural engineer, not even a scientist, structural engineer certified who tried to he was going to be the co-promoter of the first conference and there was an ethics board he was ratted out by somebody and an ethics board contacted him and said you have to distance yourself as fast as possible or we will pull your license we will pull your certification that's exactly what he did okay so i'm interested just briefly mark do 
Do flat earthers tend to be evangelical Christian and believe in creationism? Yes. Uh, at least half the community, funny question, uh, at least half the community are hardcore Christians, at least half, and maybe even more. So much so that when the first conference was done from the documentary, uh, there was backlash. Half the people wanted it to be more religious. Half the people wanted it to be less religious. So in the future conferences, we ended up having two stages, one biblical and one not. And the reason why the biblical uh, cosmology people really latched onto this, was, with one of the main reasons was a guy named Rob Skiba, who went through the King James Bible with a fine tooth comb. And he said, yeah, he goes, it's a flat earth book. There's only one verse in the entire book that even hints that it's not, and that's Isaiah 40, 22, he who sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And he was really quick to point out, he goes, look, he goes, uh, circle is not sphere, it's not ball, it's not globe in the ancient Hebrew. So it's, because the rest of it though, he goes, there's so many different flat earth references in it. He goes, it's, it's he, he dedicated a website to it called uh, testingtheglobe.com which I still, to this day, it's like, yeah, he goes, you want to look at the religious side of things, look at that, it's amazing. And it's now considered, there are Christian Flat Earth conferences, or at least there were before the whole lockdown thing, um, it, here in the United States. In fact, I was, I was not invited to, <laughs> to the Flat Earth Christian conferences because I wasn't evangelical enough, funny thing. Wow, okay. Yeah. Um, my other question is, oh yeah, um... Yeah, what, what is the dome? The dome. Oh, okay, that's a great one. Um, we probably should have opened with this, which is the, the flat earth model. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's right. It, I didn't even didn't even occur to me because a lot of people say, what does the flat earth look like? I mean, it sounds like you, you've been into it long enough that you know. But the I, I think yeah I think that's a that's a, a really good point actually. Mark. Uh, that, if you can just if you can paint a, a picture for us just so that I can try and get my listeners okay. to understand what does it look like. What does what it look like? Dome? So it's the opposite of what you've been told. You're not living on some little tiny rock flying through space at impossible speeds and impossible directions, uh, covered in a little bit of water covered with a little bit of smoke basically on top of that or a thin version of or just vapor basically because we're not breathing in nothing uh you are living in a for lack of a better term a building a, a giant snow globe if that's what works for you um with walls and a floor and a ceiling that is so big and so complex that even our best and brightest didn't figure it out until almost 1960 and when they did, they were like, yeah, we probably shouldn't tell anybody about this until we figure out what the hell's going on. Because civilization had already been built in 1960. And people's like, why not tell everybody? It's like, are you crazy? I wouldn't tell anybody in 1960. People, I mean, we saw what happened with Roswell in the United States. And the media was, people were freaking out. And that was in the 40s. That was like, like 12 years earlier. So, um, but yeah, you're living in a building. And the, the sun and the moon... So what you're saying is that in 1960, yeah. the U.S. government discovered yep. for, properly that the Earth is flat and they decided to keep it a secret. Yeah, the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, and, and mostly from the explorations in Antarctica that started in 1928 and, and really peaked out in 1955-56 with Operation Deep Freeze. Again, not secret information. That's the best part of Flat Earth. None of this stuff is secret you know declassified crap it's all it's all so out there. so continue with uh, your image then. oh yeah this yeah. is a flat disc it's it's a flat disc and, and don't space. and don't well don't think of it even in space don't it, it is this is not asgard right thor the thor movies did us no favors at all it is there's no cosmic waterfall <laughs> we're talking about just a building it might as well be a build a snow globe sitting on a desk god's desk how's that and the sun and the moon are inside it. The, the dome may be, I don't know, best guess, let's say 3,000 miles high. More than high enough for what we need. Uh, the sun and the moon are very, very tiny and are inside it. So the sun is not 93 million miles away. The moon is not 237,000 miles away. They are very, very small and less than 50 miles wide. And they're very, very close, you know, less than 3,000 miles high, which works out just the same, actually. And, and then on the edge... Oh yeah, and on the edge, the uh, you have uh, and all the continents basically look the same except for Antarctica. So again, if you want to know what it looks like, look at the UN flag. Really, really weird. 
uh, <laughs> designed in the 40s. The um, and around the only thing that's different is Antarctica. Antarctica is not uh, a, an island continent like Australia, at roughly the same size. It stretches around the entire outer rim of this thing, and it is huge. It's freaking huge. The, the, the coastline of Antarctica is not the edge of the world. It is the beginning of the edge of the world. It goes in, it's got to be thousands of miles. I mean, they were flying around it for 30 years before they figured it out. Who knows how many refueling stations they had. And it circles and around... on the other side of Antarctica? Well, that's the big question. What happens then? Well, eventually you're going to have to reach the barrier, the, you know, the, the edge of the dome, which is what I think they, they eventually found in 1955-56, uh, the, the Americans at the very least, where th that's where you can't go any further. Some sort of barrier, whatever it's made out of, I don't know, high frequency, electromagnetic, heavy element, heavy water, doesn't really matter, but they tried to punch through it for four years, the United States and the Soviet Union. Who have been allies for a long time at the high levels. We're not that much of enemies. But they tried to bust through it with atomic weapons from 1958 until 1962. And when they couldn't get through it, they just basically were mapping out the sky. They were firing all the atomic tests for those four years were straight up. And they were just basically mapping the sky. And so what's outside of this world? What's outside of that? Well, I try to only live one world at a time. Uh, I think it's uh, an unlimited uh, dimension, an unlimited world, you know, where this world is 99% conflict outside, 99% no conflict. Excellent. Okay, that's that's really, really good stuff. Oh, good. Mark, thank you so much yeah. for answering my questions. I really appreciate it. No, no. Um, hey, uh, did, I, I don't know if you guys, um, uh, you know, I, I, ca I caught some of your shows because I was looking at one of those world... Uh, things where you can go to different countries and and see what active radio stations there were, and I've I've heard some of your stuff. I, I like your I like your format. Brilliant, that's great. Thank you. Well, well, if you like, I can send you the podcast of this report. Please, yeah, that'd be, um, that'd be next week. Be lovely. Um, you, you, there'll be you know lots of other voices on it as well. But, okay. Um, yours will be featured prominently, and um, yeah, I'll send that to you, and we can keep in touch. Cool. Thank you, man. Is there, if there's any other resources, just let me know, and I'll, I'll shoot them to you. I will. Thank you so much, Mark. Have a good day. All right, you too. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.